Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are, maybe good night. It might be the middle of the night for some of you. My name is Gustavo Bondoni, and you are in the panel called Future Latin America, Rediscovering an SF Tradition in Argentina, Chile, and Mexico. Well, I'd like to introduce, first of all, I'd like to introduce my panelists. Our panelists today are, let me pull up my notes, Paula Andrade, who's a comic book writer and illustrator based in Buenos Aires. We just found out she's based 10 minutes from my house. So we could have done this like socially distanced with the, with the masks. She's one of the current voices in Argentinian comic book scene. Paula's work is known for using supernatural and mythological elements to showcase human emotions and relationships. Paula, if you could wave so they know who you are. Hello everyone, nice to be here. Then we have Gabriela Damian Mirabete. Gabriela Damian Mirabete is from Mexico City. She writes fiction and essays that embody her passion for fantasy and science fiction. She teaches film and literature, works in the Under the Volcano Writing Program, and is a co-founding member of the art and science collective Cúbulo de Tejla. Her stories are published in Three Messages and, and a Warning, which is a World Fantasy Award finalist, Cuerpos, Fantasciencia Contemporánea Española y Latinoamericana, and Una Realidad Más Amplia, A Larger Reality, which is part of the Mexicanics Initiative Scrapbook, which was a Hugo Award finalist, wow, <laughs> among others. She won the last edition of the James Triptree Jr. Award, now otherwise award, with her story, They Will Dream in the Garden, about a future Mexico in which femicides no longer exist. And then we have Rodrigo Juri, who is an author and retired high school biology teacher from Chile. His works have been published in portals, magazines, and anthologies from Chile, Argentina, Spain, France, and in Clark's world. An associate member of the SFWA, he's one of the founders of Alcif, which is the Chilean SF society. And his latest work, Notes in the Supply of Raw Material in the Bodies Market, was published in the anthology Recognizing Fascism from World Weaver Press this very year, 2020. Well, I'm Gustavo Bondoni, as I said at the beginning. Um, I'm an Argentinian writer as well, so you have two Argentinians on the panel. But I write mainly in English. And I've had, I write a little bit of short fiction and a little bit of novels in science fiction and fantasy. I've had about 300, a little more than that, stories published in English. I've had five or six novels published. And I'm currently working on the sequel to my very first novel, which is coming out next year from Garbage Books. So having introduced us, we can start off a little bit with the questions that we're going to be asking our panelists. And I'd like for, I'd like to start with Paula and oh. ask you the following. <laughs> My neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I had to start with someone. So you, 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 you actually are the first in alphabetical order. So you got it. I'm sure you're used to that by now. Oh. The panel is about rediscovering a tradition of science fiction in Latin America. What can you tell us about this tradition in Argentina? We'll do Mexico and Chile once, once you're done, and I'll add anything I can think of to Argentina once everyone else is done. Additionally, is there another tradition in another Latin American country which you feel is important re region-wide? Because we're talking about the rediscovering on a region-wide basis. Okay. Okay, it's a, a very simple question. <laughs> uh, I think that we do have a, a, a strong tradition. I think it's very Argentinian to have strong traditions in literature in general, in storytelling as well. And sci-fi is a, a very important part. We do have, I, I also come from comic books mostly. So we do have El Eternauta like in the 50s, late 50s. And I think it's uh, very iconic and something that uh, it, it, it's, it is like something that branded us in a way that, that left a, a mark in, in sci-fi and in Argentinian sci-fi. And 
I do believe that it's a language we use to criticize and to, to criticize the environment, the society, the reality we live in. And it, it changes with society as well. Current authors are more perhaps interested in uh, social issues, in gender issues. We have a lot of more women writing right now. Uh, so that's really, really good. Um, and I think it's always mutating. Perhaps the, the idea of rediscovery has to do also perhaps related to this uh, convention and this idea of global community that maybe Latin America didn't have like the camera on us, the spotlight on us so much, but we were always making things. We are always looking abroad instead of looking at ourselves. And, but, our, but we are making so many things, even when, when well, in Argentina, economy never works for us. <laughs> so perhaps we don't have the, the really big audiences or the chances to have like huge, uh, the, the amount of books we publish, like to publish 10,000 would be insane here. Uh, 10,000 issues of one book. 10,000 volumes, but there's always new books coming out. So I think that's a little bit of what makes us. And, and I do believe it, it goes beyond our borders. Um, the book with, many of us participated in American Monsters, which is a, a book about uh, South American monsters. And it showed that there's so, so much uh, richness, like so much complexity going on that mostly ours, that we have a voice of our own and we can share that voice with all the voices we've been consuming. We've been consuming so much that has to do with abroad that to be able to share that on an equal level, I think that's what today is about, the now. <laughs> Man, that's mostly, it. I, I don't want to talk too much. Please shut me up because I talk a lot. <laughs> We have time on this panel, so please talk. Okay. Gabriela, I'd like to hear your thoughts now. Oh gosh, it's, um, well, first first of all, I, I didn't say hi because <laughs> as we always um, are suffering since the start of quarantine, my mic was muted. So the most pronounced phrase <laughs> of these last months must be your mic is muted, but okay. Uh, so hi, thank you. And um, I think it's a complicated position for me to talk about Mexican tradition because um, it has so um, very difficult to establish um, Mexican science fiction as part of our literary tradition, Mexican tradition. So um, if a, a, a bunch of people haven't really um, some efforts to do this kind of historiography and extract and, and try to categorize these texts um, within Mexican literature, um, I think we, we couldn't, I, I couldn't share with you like that kind of richness before 20th century, for example. I'm, I'm baffled about the fact that science fiction is something very old indeed. It, it, it's intertwined with our um, relationship with technology. So it's, um, it's natural that since 18 or maybe 17th century, we are thinking about technology or science or knowledge. So um, one of our foundational texts, uh, science fictional texts in Mexico, it's um, a, a short story written by um, um, a monk, <laughs> uh, a monk from Yucatan, okay. which is like a, a it has influence from the French imaginations of um, Cyrano de Bergerac, for example. The the Yucat, um, it's it's not a it's not a, a Yucateco. It's not a person from Yucatan. The one who travels to the moon. It's a Frenchman. So you can see 
from the start that we are colonized <laughs> um, and we, we are um, struggling with putting ourselves like, uh, like protagonists. Uh, right. we, we don't believe that we could do that because we don't have the machine, but okay. This French guy goes to the moon and they, um, he, he met um, their antitones, which are Martians, and um, they start uh, talking bad things about Yucatan um, system of government and the, the, the crown, the, the crown, the, the viceroy, and all the um, all these aspects of the government, which was the um, the colony, of course. Okay. So um, in Mexico, is this tradition very critical with? with the systems of power that I think it's uh, what crosses all our science fiction literature. But for example, for me, because as Paula was saying, there are more and more women writing science fiction right now. For example, I personally, and I'm not the only Mexican who, who, who's doing that, <laughs> I uh, placed the origin of Mexican science fiction, for example, in Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, which is a nun. <laughs> it's, uh, one is a monk, the other one is a nun. And people who, who ran away from everyday life and, and went to convents were really, really trying to escape reality <laughs> and imagine these other possibilities um, for their own reality. So Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, for me, with um, her beautiful, beautiful, big poem, uh, Primero Sueño, starts this kind of relating to knowledge with, with it's a, this discourse, this epistemological um, issue of what does uh, knowledge mean for a body like hers? Because a woman, women can't uh, be or, or can't, can't be the subjects of, um, of this quest for knowledge. So I like to put it there, but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm like going way back <laughs> to uh, Mexican science fiction. And, um, and yeah, I, I like to, to, to reframe it like that because I think that kind of origin is like maybe reshaping the things we are writing right now because we are going, going in another direction uh, of the main discourse in science fiction in the 90s and the early 2000s, which was cyberpunk. And now I think we are trying to relate to that ancient origins to find another way to cope with our recent production. So that's it. Right. Yeah, I'm hearing, uh, well, Mexico has a very, very rich and very, very long history compared to even a lot of the rest of Latin America. Uh, but I'd like to hear what, what Rodrigo thinks. Because, I mean, I know that Mexico has a very specific tradition. Argentina has a different one. I'll talk about it a little more later. Rodrigo, I'm sure Chile has an even different one. Well, not so different indeed. I will start saying that uh, uh, where Argentina is a country of storytellers like Cortázar and Borges, Chile is a, is a country of poets. The most famous of them are Gabriela Mistral and Pablo Neruda. Um, poetry is, I mean, storytellers are far better, far better background for science fiction than poets. I mean, you, you can do poetry and science fiction, of course, but I mean, Borges and Cortázar are a far uh, a, a more fertile place for, for, for science fiction, I think. So the, the truth is that the Chilean science fiction has been always, and I, I am not ashamed to say that, to say this, the Chilean science fiction has al always looked into the other side of the, of the mountains toward Argentina. Um, uh, you said where well, other country has influenced uh, the different countries' science fiction, and Argentina has influenced us for sure. Since the times of Revista Masaya, that was a kind of kind of 
how could I say, kind of copy of Galaxy. No, not a copy because it was illegal, but, but something like that. Was it was um, by Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. So Masaya arrived to Chile, arrived. You can find it in, in bazaars. I know that because an aunt, an aunt of mine was used to buy that, that magazine. So um, yeah, L a, little a little about history, uh, historians and science fiction in my country. There are not so much of them, two or three, but they say that the first Chilean science fiction novel is that's the Jupiter from by Francisco Miralles, um, 1877, just right before the war with the Peruvians, with Peru and Bolivia. Um, and after that, we have to go until 1959 with uh, Los Altísimos de Hugo Correa. That, uh, that novel, uh, it's a kind of landmark in Chilean science fiction. And I guess it's kind of known, known in, in Latin America in a way. Uh, it started the golden age of Chilean science fiction with three big names, Hugo Correa, and, um, Antonio Montero, and Elena Aldunate. These three guys were the most important Chilean science, science fiction writers uh, in the 20th century. Um, but, as a, uh, but as a, well, Hugo Correa was a kind of friend of Ray Bradbury, so there is some kind of influence from there. Also, Correa was able to publish in fantasy and science fiction. Charlie Finley was, wasn't the director in that time. <laughs> So he was able to publish in fantasy science fiction. <laughs> and, even before Charlie. See, <laughs> so it was a kind of hero of Chilean science fiction. The other guy, the Montero and Aldunate also, uh, um, we are proud to have Aldena Aldunate as a pioneer in Chilean science fiction as a, as a woman. And we can say that our, one of our founders was a, was a woman. Um, uh, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, we, we have been always looking to the other side. And in, in that time was uh, Masaya, after that was, well, right now, we, uh, Quasar, do you remember Quasar? I think that Pendulo is, is, is Argentinian also, no? Yes. Yes. So all these magazines arrived to Chile and in a way we, uh, where our link or where our bridge to the global science fiction. Thank you. Well, that's, that's very good. And, it, and it, it's a great segue to what I was going to say, because as I, told my, as I told the panel before we started the public part of this, I'm very traditional. So when I talk about Argentinian science fiction, I was going to talk about three things. One of them Paula already mentioned, which is the Eternauta, which is one of our classics, which is why I let Paula go first, because if not, it looks like the moderator is stealing everybody's, everybody's words, but there are two, two other people that I need to, to point to as the traditional science fiction uh, origins on the liter purely literary side of Argentina, which are Jorge Luis Borges and Adolfo Villa Casares. Um, they are the two people who actually made science fiction respectable in Argentina, because it used to be, as it happens in a lot of places, a niche which people would call even a ghetto it was a very small audience and it wasn't very respectable from the, from the literary side. In fact, up until even 1979, people were still trying to say, well, Borges isn't really a science fiction writer. He's a fantasist and that's more of what Argentinian canon is about. So, so those two are the two who really started Argentinian science fiction on a, on a large scale. Of course, we've had many, many, many writers. And we're also proud that one of our major, perhaps the most important current Argentinian science fiction writer is Angelica Gorodischer. So we also are very well represented by a woman, which is great. And we have, and the current generation also, also represented by another man called Marcelo Cohen. And um, so, so we, have, we have a tradition. Our tradition isn't anywhere near as, I think, as old as the Mexican tradition from what I was hearing. It's, it's more of a, a very much a 20th century tradition, but that's the tradition that we are trying to revive today. And as, as Rodrigo was saying, we have Quasar, we have Axon right now, which is an online magazine. We also have a print magazine called Proxima, which oh. is 
which is, well, we're all smiling because we're all very, very good friends with the editor. <laughs> and she is, she is the powerhouse of, of the social side of Argentinian science fiction today. She, when there's no pandemic, she, she brings us forcefully together once a month to, to drink, drink and talk about science fiction. And, and well, my, my introduction to the Chilean, the current Chilean science, one of the current Chilean science fiction people was actually there. I met Leonardo at one of her, one of her get togethers. So that's what I have to say in addition to what Paula already said. And I'd like to say something to the audience now, which is um, a lot of you are already typing in questions, which is great. Type them all in, I am getting them. And I will choose once we get through the original the, the, the original questions that we had set out, set aside for the, for the panelists, we will have approximately half an hour for questions at the end, okay? So our next scheduled question, if you like, is now that this tradition is being rediscovered, where do you fear, feel this new genre revitalization fits in the literary landscape of the region? Is it part of the mainstream or is it still in that particular niche? And well, Gabriela, I'm gonna put you on the spot this time. So go ahead and lead it off. Okay, so one thing I, I forgot to mention because I, I was fascinated with monks and nuns <laughs> was that, um, of course, Jorge Luis Borges and um, Adolfo Bioy Casares and Silvina and Victoria Ocampo uh, are capital for our literary form formation in Mexico. In indeed, I think they allowed us to write in that register. Yeah, if they were not considered this, um, this kind of respectable writers, <laughs> we couldn't have anything get done in terms of um, fantastic, the fantastic uh, fantasy or science fiction. In uh, Mexico, that is um, looking toward Argentina, particularly in this respect, in this um, in this literary tradition that is um, non-realistic but respectable. On the other hand, I think we are, Mexico is guilty of being a little bit separated from Latin America, which I, um, I, I, I'm truly sorry. I, I ask your sorry for, <laughs> for that because we are like, enamored with the North American model, the Anglo-Saxon model. And we were always looking, um, looking up there to Anglo-Saxon models. So, uh, and, well, our, our nearness to the frontier and our relationship with that country makes um, this a very complex um, dynamic. But in terms of language, in terms of um, explorations, I think Argentinian literature has been capital for, for Mexican fantastic in general. And um, coming back to, the, to your question, no, this is still a niche in, in Mexico because um, when when popular literature in Mexico um, starts to, uh, to go, well, reframe it. Uh, when literature in Mexico start going this popular direction, this, um, this discourse of, um, or trying to emulate these works, science fictional works, um, it lost respectability. It, if it wasn't like uh, the Borges or Bioy Casares literature and uh, resemble more to the North American model, it was completely um, categorized as, as garbage. So that remains because Mexican uh, literary tradition is based on the Mexican revolution ideals and the relationship between the political and the arts and literary and arts landscape. So um, the discourse is that we must face reality and resolve it through our art because we have urgent um, social, uh, uh, economic and political things that must be resolved and literature must serve that. 
the problem is that our main, um, for example, our main um, piece of work of that kind of literature is uh, Pedro Paramo from Juan, from Juan Rulfo, which is a ghost novel, but no one wants to recognize that <laughs> because if would not, you, it would be garbage. Would you say that, 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 that Juan Rulfo um, comes into conversation with the rest of the Latin American fantasy realist, magical realism? Because I, I think it, it lands there. We, we're going to have to talk about the magical realists at some point because we're not going to be able to <laughs> That. Yeah, I, totally. I that, yeah, that, that because it's, I think, one of these um, common traces that maybe we could agree. I, I don't know if you agree in, uh, with me in, on this, but uh, um, fan, the fantastic and uh, science fiction in Latin America, it's very intertwined. Our um, categories are external, magical realism, new weird, for example. But we are producing this kind of stuff since many years ago, many decades ago. And now they came these this etiquettes. And, and we know that that's the thing we do. We know we do weird. And now new weird, for example. We, we know that what magical realism is for us, but not for that etiquette. etiquette. So um, I think. Uh, I talk about Pedro Paramo when I am talking about science fiction because um, the same disregard that exists to science fiction is, exists to the fantastic or to this kind of um, non-realistic narratives, at least in Mexico. So if you are writing this kind of literature in Mexico, you are niche literature. You, you must face um, narco, you must face violence, you must face, um, yeah, political issues or even very bourgeois issues mm -hmm. in, in very nice neighborhoods. That is authorized. What is not authorized is imagination. So that's very sad. And does that hold for the other um, magical realists, for Garcia Marquez or for Vargas Llosa, the imported work has the same problem? No, 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 because because they they don't have that kind of responsibility. Okay. So <laughs> we have we as Mexicans have it. Okay, wow, interesting, interesting. Okay, thank you. That was great. Uh, I'll, I'll go on with Rodrigo if you could give us your thoughts. To change the whole the order. Um, well, uh, the the Chilean market of literature is is very small. No, imagine the size of the science fiction market. So uh, we have, a, uh, right now we have an explosion, a, a kind of explosion of Chilean science fiction writers. But, uh, and, and, and I, I want to say something about the editors. I mean, I mean, I want to name Luis Saavedra from Fogos Magazine and Marcelo Novoa from Puerto, Puerto Escape that uh, has been working from decades trying to publish some science fiction. Luis Avera in short stories and Marcelo Novoa in novels. They have been working hard, hard, hard. And they, uh, and they have and they uh, have been able to establish a kind of community of science fiction and fantasy writers. Uh, uh, but it's a niche, of course it's a niche. I mean, uh, few people both buy the, buy the books, um, but in general, I mean, literature in general, and as I said, science fiction is especially. Uh, but there is an exception, uh, two exceptions. Uh, and that's, the two exceptions are uh, our main names right now that are Jorge Baradit and uh, uh, Francisco Ortega. These two guys have been able to break the break the limit, break the frontier, and, and go into mainstream, selling lots of lots of books in big companies, big publishers like Planeta or some or, uh, or I don't know Penguin, but but, but there are some writers in Penguin also. Um, and but 
at the cost. And the cost was that they must do, they should be leaving, left, leaving aside science fiction. Uh, Jorge Baradit is writing right now uh, historical issues and, um, and Pancho and Francisco is writing thrillers in the line of ter conspiracy theories and things like that. But even so, we, every, everybody, knows, everybody knows that they were in the first time, in first moment, science fiction writers. And in a way they are a flag uh, of our intentions in the mainstream market. Okay. Oh no, we left you for last this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well, I, because I, I come mostly for, from comics <laughs> and, and books. Uh, I have great respect for pop culture as well, um, and for things that are usually considered like minor, like lower literature or lower um, works, because I think it's more important what they trigger in people. So maybe there is a book that might be considered by the standard, like it's, that it's really pop, but it makes someone think in a different way. So I think that's the, the value of literature. But I can also notice it, it happened this year with the contest. We are having a contest in Argentina of a literature contest. And for the first time, it's about sci-fi and fantasy. And I was so surprised to see backlash. Like, no, why? It's not serious. But it's, it's really serious to, to imagine a reality that's different takes a lot of work <laughs> and takes a, demands a lot of our minds. And, and to see another perspective takes so much from us. So to, to see that there was a backlash, I was kind of surprised because I am mostly surrounded by authors from sci-fi. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Teresa Mira de Echeverria, a current Argentinian artist. I think she's brilliant. Like, I, I love her work. Uh, she's poetic and, and complex. And, and romantic and creates these uh, narratives that have a lot of Argentina, but also are, are, are extremely human, that everyone can relate. She, I think she can write a story, anything. She can write anything. But at the same time, I know she's not fully known here. Like we know her, we might have heard from her, but you don't find her uh, in the main area of a bookshop. Right. And, and she should be there. Mariela Papas is another author that's moving her work a lot. Uh, but I, perhaps because I am so surrounded by it, I still get surprised when people don't know about them or there is this backlash. Like, why would anyone be against sci-fi? Why would anyone be against fantasy or new weird? Like Gabriela mentioned, new weird is, is us. <laughs> it's uh, Latin America. We've been playing with it since forever. And, and we have such uh, strong elements to write from it and, and to see the world and ourselves from different perspectives. But perhaps there is still this, uh, from, from perhaps from the maybe press, some of the press that doesn't understand what's going on, perhaps not having the right journalist, sometimes being in charge of writing the stories, like the, the marketing around the books, that changes so much because usually it's if you present a book as serious from marketing, people will take it seriously regardless of what's inside. Of course, so yes, yes, usually it's it's. Uh, I am also a publisher, so <laughs> I, I, I sometimes kind of technical, uh, but the way we present our work matters so much. Uh, a, a poor cover will will doom a book to a, a, a bad area of the bookshop, or it will make it not look like uh, what's expected by the, the mainstream. And sometimes you have to play a little bit with the mainstream. I, I think it's like trolling the mainstream, like trying to be, okay, yes, I'm selling you this, that you understand what it is, you get it. You read it and it's something else completely. Uh, I think we have to play a little bit more with that because I, honestly, I was so surprised by the, by the backlash. I, was, I couldn't understand it. We have uh, Borges, we have a lot of authors that are, it's impossible to deny them. Right. Uh, 
it's impossible. El Eternauta is also undeniable. So it was like, why everyone is like, no, the price, the literature price can't be for science fiction. That's like, I, I agree absolutely. And I think, I think it's, it's kind of weird. And I don't know if it happens in all of Latin America, but here in, you look at Argentinian society and everybody's watching Game of Thrones or Strange yeah. Day Netflix or whatever. And they don't watch anything that doesn't have either a science fiction or a fantasy element. They don't watch, they don't even watch Friends anymore. I mean, they, they don't watch anything that doesn't have a science fiction or fantasy element. But when you, when you take that, when you try to extrapolate that to local, locally produced literature, they're very, very, very hard to convince. Even though, as Paolo was just saying, the man who is considered our greatest writer, who is yes. Lawrence, is a fantasist. He's a, a fantasist. He's not, I mean, he does have some other kinds of stories, but everything he wrote, at least on the fiction side, can be interpreted through a fantastic lens. Even the, the gaucho stories can be interpreted that way. So it's, it's very interesting to hear that we all seem to be having the same kind of problem establishing the genre within, within the markets. And there's a question that just came in from the, from the, from the audience, which I think is, would work perfectly in this particular moment of our conversation. So I'm gonna change the rules again and, and put the question in here. The question is this, should professional science fiction in Latin America follow different market standards as opposed to the Anglo-Saxon model? It's, imagine, it's hard to imagine it being profitable in the same way. And I would like to say that I have never managed to find a paying Latin American market. So of 300 odd stories I've published, exactly four of them have been translated to Spanish. I did the translation myself and I did not get paid a cent for them. They're online on Axon. So I would like to hear from each of you what you think of this. I'll start with Rodrigo if, you, if, if you'd like. I think you're the only one who hasn't started yet. <laughs> no. Well, it's the only, the only magazine in Spanish that I think that is by paying a bit is Window Manut from Spain. Window Manut is paying 75 euros for a short story, no matter the length. Um, but it's true. I mean, uh, we have no paying markets. Never. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Masaya paid something. I think I don't know. I don't think so. Um, so I don't know any other. But of course, there is reasons, obvious reason for that. There's the size of the market. The size of the market is short. The other thing that you said that uh, people prefer, e even if they like science fiction, they are going to go to the American writers or English writers in first place. And just as a second, in second place or third place or last place, uh, local science fiction writers. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, it, it says a lot about this issue of colonization, but I'm not going to into that now. Uh, and, um, and yeah, no, uh, well. And it's, it's, the, it's the reality. I mean, if you, if you write in Spanish, you must know that you, even if you are good, you are going to be publishing in websites, some platforms that are, are free, are free to pay and free to, to distribute. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I must be fair with uh, my contemporaries. <laughs> Because I, I'm very like thinking in historical terms and what does that implies right now for, for the community. But there has always been a science fiction community in Mexico, especially since the um, 60s, 70s, readers that are very eager to know each other and to create ways of letting out that uh, production of interesting works. So. Um, although Mexican science fiction has made its way through the mainstream literature, and that's why I, I was saying to you that uh, this labor of love from his historians uh, um, specialized in science fiction was to catalog that production hidden in the, in the mainstream literature um, and 
in the in the corners of our uh, cultural productions, cultural objects. Um, there has been a lot of fanciness, um, a, a lot of, of fanciness. Well, you know what I mean. A, a lot of amateur magazines from fans that um, that kept alive this, uh, this genre. And today it's happening the same thing just online uh, as, as Rodrigo was saying. We are um, trying to, to produce and to publish in, um, in magazines that we, maybe they won't endure so much, but uh, the, re the register remains. For example, La Langosta Se Ha Posteado, which was um, which was recorded on floppy disks, for example, on the on the eighties and the nineties, uh, and now it's an electronic magazine, uh, led by two very um, capital science fiction writers, Gerardo Horacio Porcayo and Jose Luis Zarate. So um, I think this remains, uh, but our biggest problems is, as Paula was saying, it's. Um, like the system itself, because it's not only like uh, literary criticism in specialist magazines or, or journalists, that the loss of those mainstream spaces or, or those spaces in general for mainstream literature is a loss for us because we were underrepresented there, but we were uh, able to, to talk about literature somewhere. So that's terrible. but. It's also terrible that we don't have a specialized editorials, publishers for um, genre in, in Latin America. I think that they are, you have more than, for example, in Mexico, we, we don't have very, um, there are not um, very recognizable or visible uh, publishers that uh, say allow I am publishing fantasy and science fiction. Nobody wants to do that because it's not profitable as you were saying, Gustavo. And also um, we, um, we are producing a lot to get it translated and, and get it published in the USA. Um, good news, for example, right now it's um, Strange Horizons made a, a special um, call for Mexican writers specifically with a Mexican editor, Lidia Brenda, which was nominated for the Hugo Award for this anthology you mentioned, A Larger Reality. So we are going to have a, a special number um, translated into English and Spanish in Strange Horizons, but we are depending Nice. Of, of that name or, and of that opportunity to get paid and to get published and to get visible. So yeah. I think also academia is responsible or, or, or maybe the syllabus in our courses that uh, don't include nor science fiction, nor women in their, <laughs> in their courses. So um, that's an, a missed opportunity um for just us to to be read one of the other listener questions you just answered paula as a publisher what's we'd love to get your perspective on this as well <laughs> well uh i'm mostly an author that had to become a publisher so i, I think that says a lot <laughs> of, of our market yes. uh, i learned yes uh, uh, i learned a lot by becoming a publisher it, i think that i <laughs> I don't know if every author, I understand that for many authors, the idea of publishing is like, they don't have one to, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Like it's, it's too administrative or, or technical or on, on an issue that doesn't have to do with the same creativity that goes into writing. I do think it demands a lot of creativity to be a publisher, but it's like you have to make a switch and it made me understand differently the the literature marketplace, the, this this idea of industry or small industry. There's always so many words here to see. Do we have an industry? We don't have an industry. I, I prefer not to get into that. <laughs> but uh, I do believe that many of the problems have to do with uh, that publishing is a business in a way. 
if, even if, in, if, in the smallest way, if, if we think about it, it's like someone putting money of their pocket to uh, publish a book. So at least they, they expect to recover that money. Uh, someone is investing uh, money into making that book. And the problem could be that many of the big publishers that, that do take over a lot of the, of the power <laughs> in, in, in publishing really see books as uh, um, products to, in which they can get the most money, the, the money that's certain, like they won't take many risks with uh, new authors, like they have a smaller amount uh, of resources for new authors, uh, smaller amounts of money for marketing for new authors. Uh, it will be more like uh, a little bit more strategic, the, 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 and a strategy in the way they became. I, I walked out of uh, talks that the main publishers were giving at the Feria del Libro, at our main uh, book fair. I, I walked out because they were only talking about revenue. And I was like, you can't pick a book like this. You can't pick a project thinking only of, okay, maybe in, in this area, it sounds more like this, it sounds more like that, because that's uh, thinking really lowly of the readers. Right. Like it's, you're underestimating, underestimating the readers when you do that. Yeah. Because in, in my experience as a publisher, I don't know, uh, my, my publishing house is really small. Uh, usually my books are around 1000 volumes. It's between uh, reprinting and everything, um, but it sustains itself. So I think that the, the thing is that we need more publishing houses. We need more publishers. We need more editors. And I also think that authors, I'm going to be controversial here. I think authors need to grow a little bit of a backbone and take over, take control of our work because no one will sell it with the same hunger and with the same passion and the same understanding that we will put into it. And I, I do believe that the, an external vision is really helpful, but it also helps to understand the whole, uh, like the whole picture. Right. It's like when we hear, oh, why the, the authors only get the 10%? If we start to consider all the, the, the areas that demand money of making a book, there's not much left. <laughs> so it's, instead of complaining, making more things like uh, talking with our readers, uh, being in contact with them, because if we don't do that, I, I heard that many of the, of the bigger publishing houses, they are not even making the, the marketing area anymore, like they throw it at the authors. So we have to be like doing everything. Uh, I was so shocked because I, I, again, I come from comics. I was like, oh, my area is going to be the ones. <laughs> I was ready. Uh, and when talking with other uh, book publishers and other writers, they were like, no, the, 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 the publishing house doesn't uh, book me my, I don't know, my presentations, my openings. They don't make it them. I have to do them myself. And I was like, with my authors, I prepare everything myself. I am the one talking with uh, the bookshops to take the books there, to see if we can have a talk there, uh, to, to make sure uh, people can talk to the authors and get their books signed. And, and, and that's a lot of legwork. That's a lot of legwork. So I have a, a lot of respect to, for publishers uh, because it takes a lot of time. But when there are so few opportunities to get into the main publishing houses and, and it's also not ideal, like we need more variety. So I think authors need to, to start taking over and not waiting, not waiting for the one of the three or four uh, publishing houses that are doing something more or less. Like, no, we need more. We need to be more in contact with one another. Like to talk with the, the people at the bookshops. I, I always go there and I ask them, okay, uh, how is this working? What else can I do to make it work better? And luckily the, the comic books uh, 
area, we are few, so we are really in touch. But with all the years doing this, I have like the contacts from the press, from the, the, the bookshops, from the printers. So it's learning who to talk to as well, learning which uh, journalists you get better on, who understands better your work, and, and like being like, here's my book. <laughs> if you want to talk about it, it would be great. But that's a lot of work that I think we have to do. That it's, if I wouldn't, I think that as a woman that started in 2001 here in Argentina in the middle of a crisis, uh, that wrote fantasy and, and new weird and sci-fi and I was playing with mangas a lot. I, I, there were no other way I was going to get published. Right. No other way, because everyone else were men <laughs> and friends. So it's really hard to get into a circle of men of male friends and, and to get them to understand your work instead of wanting them to change it. Because it's usually that what happens is like, no, you should work more like this. You should tell the story like this. And, and to have that, uh, that kind of, of uh, eyes set upon me, like that, that view of my work, uh, it, it, it would have uh, damaged my career, I think, if I was listening and behaving and waiting. So I do, I do believe authors uh, need to, to step up a little bit into the, the more uh, administrative, the more <laughs> uh, like secretarial work, a little bit, just to, to even to, to ask for better contracts. Right. Because uh, that way you understand what's in the contract, what it means, like, and what you can negotiate, because there are so few contracts going on that sometimes people just accept them, like, okay, yes, whatever you say, Mr. Publisher. And the, the publishing houses are likely to just send you the worst possible contract they can. Of course. To see if you say something like, okay, will you take it? <laughs> so we need to fight for our rights and to share our work and, and try to share it the most professional way we can. Like, no, I, I don't think, I, I think that the, the, the more uh, underground area of sci-fi and, and, and of, uh, I, I, when I say pop literature, I say with the most respect, I don't say it in any other way. Uh, but the non-mainstream, the non-mainstream uh, works, it's, it's great that there's such an underground uh, community, an underground production of work, but we also have to stop like thinking it's a us versus them thing. It's not, it's like, we can make our work more professional. We can present it better. We all know that it's not a matter of the quality of the stories. The stories are great. It's the way and the places they are being presented. It's like saying it's enough if it's just in this little, little small corner. Why not do a slight takeover? <laughs> uh, uh, one step over the other one. I agree with you absolutely, I think. The, I mean, other markets, even the comic book market, is a lot more mature than the literary market, especially at least in Argentina. I can't speak for mm -hmm. other countries in accepting that this is a big market. This is mainstream. This isn't a tiny little underground niche anymore. And I, I agree with you absolutely. Um, I'm going to skip to the to question number three because we're we already answered number four. So I'm going to ask you to be very quick. <laughs> And in two or three words, because I don't want I don't want to lose the time for questions. In two or three words, give me the answer to the following question. And I'm going to start with you, Gabriela. So I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> How do you feel that Latin American science fiction fits within the worldwide landscape? Do you think there are specific regions, social trends, or ideologies that fit within the Latin American psyche that are explored within the context of our regional SF? Very quickly, go. <laughs> God, oh my God, the pressure. Um, I think we have a lot to offer to the world because we have this uh, condition of um, social inequality and uh, underdevelopment and um, a lot of 
uh, political struggle and resistance uh, that we can dialogue very deeply with some of this stuff from a place, um, a very humane place, a very, very, yeah, but a very humane struggle with those kinds uh, of, of, um, of, yeah, human struggle. So we are facing that every day and we need a lot of imagination to reshape our reality. Um, and at the same time, we are doing that in fiction. I think um, fiction and reality are tremendously intertwined and um, the, the people that are writing science fiction right now in Latin America is trying to uh, bring a lot of that um, political fire um, to, the, uh, to their stories, but not to be uh, accommodating to the power or to the mainstream, what li the literary landscapes um, it's, it's going to, 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 to be pleased of, um, but to rebuild our um, relationship with, with reality, with uh, ourselves, with our communities I want, uh, and our brothers in Latin America even. So I think we, we could bring that. The, the thing about um, this very diffused frontiers between fantastic and science fiction um, has to do with very, I, I would say, very even spirit, spiritual um, way of being in the world that we bring even in science fiction. So um, we have a, a very nuanced, a very rich um, way of seeing fiction and reality because we are dealing with a lot of uh, levels of human struggle. So we, we are bringing powerful stuff to the genre, I, I think. I that, that people in the traditionally, let's say, um, developed world are starting to struggle with a lot of the, the, the issues that we've been struggling with for years now. Um, and I, Rodrigo, I'll, I'll let you go next. And what do you think? Where, where does it fit? Well, uh, Gorilla is right, of course. Um, our political, ideological, you know, social context, it's an asset in terms of literary, literary background. But there are other things that we can offer. Gabriela spoke about that, so I'm not going about uh, take the same topic. Uh, we can offer uh, our Aboriginal cultures. Uh, we can put our uh, our the mythologies, the the reality of our uh, people, the land people, the old ones, in our stories. And there are some people doing that. Um, there is freshness there. There is uh, originality. Uh, there is uh, well, a, a deep deep ocean of possibilities if we go to our uh, Aboriginal people. Um, also, also the, um, uh, the, um, we can work uh, a little bit more closely with magic realism or the traditional fantasy of, of our countries. I mean, uh, in order to produce a, a kind of different science fiction, not the usual one. It's, instead, it's good, I think. We, we could look uh, to Asimov, Henley, and Clark. It's fine, it's fine. But as I said before, we have Borges, we have Cortázar, we have many others, uh, as I said, uh, many others. We can look at them also, and we can produce a, 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 tr a truly Hispano American science fiction, I think. And also, we have this, this thing. Uh, um, of solar punk that our friends of Brazil are so enthusiastic about. Uh, so it's, it's a different line, a new one, and I think that it has all, a lot of things to offer. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. I, Paula, this is a hard one to go last, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we are giving them the chance to see a part of the world that was missing from the then I also agree with everything Gabriela and Rodrigo said, but I do believe that 
uh, everyone as readers, we, them, everyone in, in any part of the world, if we only see one segment and one way of, of uh, approaching a subject, like, I don't know, it won't be the same as, as all the panels in this convention will, will prove that it's not the same view that uh, our authors from Asia will have and authors from Europe will have and authors from I don't know, any part of the world will have. So it's important that all of us are represented. I think that's the opportunity we are giving. It's not uh, so much, I, I have no doubts we have to we'll offer a lot of things like any author in the world has a lot to offer. But this is an opportunity we are giving the rest of the world that has been also uh, being fed the same uh, perspective and the same viewpoint for decades. Right. It's not just uh, us receiving only the Anglo-Saxon books. It's the Anglo-Saxon readers only receiving the Anglo-Saxon books. <laughs> How many times can you hear the same elements being told in this, even if the, if the stories are different, it's the same toys we are playing with. Right. It, it gets to a point that you want other toys to play with. And it's right. also more realistic of the world we live in. You can't say something is global if part of the world is being kept away from that. That's not a, a global community. And sci-fi by nature, it's global, it's humanity we're talking about. Right. So I think this is an opportunity for readers that have, have missed the, the chance of seeing part of the world from seeing it, from seeing how other people live, how other people think, and the kind of imagination that has uh, produced in us. So. I agree. With you. <laughs> and I'm going to add one final thing, which is that I, th I feel when I read a book or a, or a story written by a Latin American in general, that the, when, the, when Latin Americans think of writing fiction that is revolutionary, that breaks the rules, they go a lot deeper than other cultures. They go a lot farther. They break all the taboos. And that's something that I think that I think it's not particularly necessarily part of my style. I'm talking about other Latin American authors, but I think it's something that it definitely, definitely will help if they can accept it. Will help the rest of the world look at science fiction differently as well. It's already happening, but we can add to this process. Now, I'm going to ask you something very difficult. I'm going to ask you to recommend two books or two authors that you think represent science fiction in your country. I will start because I don't want Paula stealing mine. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know Paula's gonna choose something different from me. So I will start with something very traditional, which is if you haven't read Borges and you haven't read Bioy Casares, that is definitely the place to start in Argentina. And just to prove that she was going to have something different to say, I'll let Paula go next. Okay, so of course, read the Letanauta, read it, please. Uh, it's going to be made into a series in Netflix, it's like everywhere, <laughs> it's going to be fun, but the, the comic book is really, really, really good. And uh, Teresa Mira Echeverria is my go-to author to recommend right now. Uh, she's really, really prolific. She's been published, I think, everywhere in, in the sci-fi arena, uh, but her viewpoint is uh, wonderful. And not so much a recommendation, but a suggestion also to play a little bit with comic books, also with the sci-fi idea. There's more in common than, than sometimes we think. Rodrigo, your turn. You want, you want, they kill me, huh? you know? <laughs> I'm a member of the society, so I'm going to name two, I'm going to say two names and the other 10, 20 authors are going to kill me. That, that's your... <laughs> Intention, no? Yes. <laughs> it's a very difficult situation for me because all of them are my friends. Don't, so, don't Choose two huh? now and then send the, the, the whole list to Renan 
So he can put it on the YouTube and you can put a, a, a complete list of recommendations. Um, no, I'm going to say only one name because uh, uh, I can say that it's the most awarded one. So I guess, yeah, he has awards, so I name him. <laughs> and it's a kind of safe line. But if I start saying other names, it would be why him, why not, or her. So I will recommend Roberto Sangüesa, twice winner of the uh, this, uh, Spanish Awards. Uh, nothing, not the other one, the one that they, uh, I don't remember the name of the award, but he has two of that of that awards. And uh, so it's, he's kind of cyberpunk, uh, kind of. So Roberto Sangüesa, that's my safe recommendation because it has awards. <laughs> Well, Gabriela, your turn. Thank God for anthologies. I'm going to mention <laughs> two books, and both are anthologies <laughs> that have all the names you want, all the contemporary and past Mexican names you want in your life. And these two books are <laughs> um, the one that was uh, nominated for a Hugo part of a Mexican Next initiative. It's called A Larger Reality. It has, well, the, the one who was nominated for a uh, Hugo um, is A Larger Reality, Una Realidad Más Amplia, Bicultural um, Stories Written in the, no, Mexican Stories Written in the Bicultural Margin, I, I, I guess. <laughs> and um, Mexican American and Mexicans are represented in this volume with short stories from um, from weird to science fiction, and uh, this has um, this book has another volume, which is at the same time a book and an app and a video game. It's called A Larger Reality, Una Realidad Más Amplia 2.0, and both are available for free online, so you can um, you can have. All those uh, very important Mexican names like Pepe Rojo, Jose Luis Zárate, Andrea Chapela, Ileana Vargas, Alberto Chimal, which, by the way, was um, included in the big book of modern fantasy by uh, Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. Alberto Chimal is our like uh, safe name, uh, as Rodrigo <laughs> said. Um, and yeah, you have there. You have a a, a, a feast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Could I? Could I? An anthology. My second name. <laughs> <laughs> this anthology is a joint venture, um, Argentinian and Chilean writers. So I think it's very cool. Excellent. It's ed edited, edited by Sergio Galvan Harman. So it has a lot of writers from Chile and Argentina. So I think that it's a good. Yeah. Okay, so just a no, quick note to the panelists. By my watch, it's just a little less than 25 minutes left. So we're going to move to um, the reader questions. One of them that I read earlier and I told, I, I gave you a little bit of a warning, we're not going to be able to escape from magic realism, is the question about genre distinctions within the region. Like, do we have a specific science fiction, fantasy, and horror genre, or is it all mashed together, or is there something intermediate that we should be talking about? Gabriela, go ahead. Or, oh wait, does anyone want to take this question? Because this is a reader question, it's not one of the ones we all have to answer. Okay, now we need to go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I think um, as a community, we are all together. We, we have, uh, for example, in Mexico City, we have a very, we have a geographical setting in the north of uh, Mexico City, which is um, a market, a street market called El Chopo. And in El Chopo, you find all the weird people smashed together, punks, darks, emo, all the subcultures are at El Chopo, Al Tianguis El Chopo. So <laughs> uh, genre in Mexico is like that. We are all together because we know if we are uh, together, we are stronger. So um, I think many of us, uh, writes in, in, in writing in different genres. I, I myself, for example, I write mainly science fiction, but in the past I wrote a lot of horror 
but I was horrified by Mexican violence and that, um, that brought me down and start writing positive science fiction or uh, I, I tried to focus uh, on the future, uh, more, more amicable future for, for us. So um, I think that's in general, uh, there's a lot of, um, of we new weird or weird, how however you want to call it in Mexico, there's a lot of that. Um, there's a little bit of fantasy, even um, very, uh, fant a fantasy very influenced by the Anglo-Saxon um, traditional fantasy. Um, a, a few authors are um, drawn into that. So it's, it's very interesting, it's very diverse. In Mexico, the landscape, it's um, very, very, very rich. And there's also, um, for example, I think maybe this um, Paula would have to confirm, but um, I think for, for example, myself and other authors are very um, trying to bring the, the kind of science fiction and fantasy Ursula K. Le Guin wrote because Ursula K. Le Guin in spite of being so, 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 so important, wasn't mentioned in our science fiction courses, wasn't um, given the, she, she wasn't as important as Asimov and Bradbury and all the male part. So uh, there's a, a little sector that is looking uh, to, towards Ursula K. Le Guin writing and that's, only that only could be good for the future for our our letters in the future okay paula what do you, what do you say i i think oh, i i was listening to gabriel and i got trapped into her story and i got lost <laughs> the question has to do with genre mixing and matching uh, in Latin oh, America. Okay. and it's yeah, really I, I, you can answer if you want <laughs> I really agree with her because uh, also I think togetherness makes us stronger and it, I, in, in, it's also like the, the publishing mentality. We need to have a stronger uh, market presence. So I don't understand when there is the, when there are like, like these little wars, horror versus sci-fi and don't join my club. It doesn't make any sense. I, I, I read any kind of book, regardless of the genre. And I also, when I write, I play with different uh, genres. Uh, I, I, I think we would be missing the chance. Also as authors, we authors rarely, rarely just marry with one kind of, of story. We, we play with them. It's more like an interest. We're always playing with the same interests in different ways because we grow as, as individuals. So I think there's no need to, to have everything apart. Yes, to, to maybe, okay, someone really loves reading horror, they will search for the horror section. We do have, yes, it's, it's something that has to do with the, with the readership. I, I don't think it has to do with the authors. And as, as Gabriela mentioned, Ursula, I remember Liliana Godoc here in Argentina, a fantasy author really, really big fantasy author. So it's, it's this chance of, uh, the, I, I do believe that the more books we have, the better. The more authors we have, the better it is. The, the more inclusive a book fair is, the better it is. So if we keep uh, putting everything together and again, staying only in, okay, I'm comfortable in my little corner, then, it's, it's going to die there in that little corner. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a need to, to give everything apart. Right, Rodrigo, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think that gender exists. I mean, we're having this conversation, we're having speaking about the, the market of science fiction. Uh, so even if we want it or not, and if it's good or not, uh, it's a reality and, and it has to do it's not well from from one side we have the writers 
some of them, and I include, I include myself, I, I declare myself a science fiction writer. And that's a statement. Yeah. Uh, but also from the point of view of the reader, uh, because he, he has expectations on the genre. So he wants his, and that's genre theory, no? I mean, he, he's looking when he is presented in front of a horror book, he knows what he's buying, more or less. So I think it's a necessity, it's a necessity, this, this thing of the genres. But it's a reality also. Mm. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that we cannot get together. I mean, I, I'm, in, in, in our association, see, we have science fiction writer, fantasy writer, and horror writer. Everybody knows that this are bro it is a brothership among these three genders. It could be weird to have somebody who writes romance or pink, uh, pink stories. I don't know. It would be kind of weird. But anyway, if you can come, we, we can meet. Um, right now, well, that's another thing. Uh, topic. Uh, so the one thing is not, uh, it's, it's, it's one thing is the market, is the distinctions in the market and the expectations of the, of the readers and writers. And the other thing is the community. And the community, as, as my fellow panelists have said, is diverse. I, usually there is friendship, not always. There is always some, some people who, you know, small families has, always some have some some noise inside yeah, and it's a kind of interesting that uh, there is some flavor on that <laughs> so yeah that's my answer okay well personally I'm, I'm a mess because I, I i do what you you wouldn't want which is i write all three genres and then i write literary fiction and i write a little bit of romance <laughs> and some thrillers <laughs> and there's a little bit of everything but yeah I, I have to compartmentalize. So what I find sometimes is that I don't mix genres when I'm when I'm doing that. So so it's so it's kind of like when I'm writing science fiction, I'm writing science fiction. When I'm writing fantasy, I'm writing fantasy. It's very unusual for me to mix them, and it's like a psychological block I have in my own head, which doesn't allow me to do both. So we have time basically for one more reader question. So. I'm going to choose the one about, there's someone who's asking, why is this panel called Rediscovering? And the, the answer to that is it was set by, the, by FutureCon. So what I want to ask the panelists, if any of them want to take this challenge is, do you feel that we need to rediscover a tradition here? Or is it a reevaluation or is it something else? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Does anyone want to take it? Raise your hand. First one who raises your hand gets the question. Go Rodrigo. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for somebody, I mean, I'm going to speak the case of Chile. That is the case that I, I most know about. Yeah, every I think that most of the Chilean writers of science fiction, fantasy, and horror knows the story of, of, of our science fiction, fantasy, and horror. But for a foreigner, should be kind of islands of bubbles in the sky. I mean, they will maybe know something. They have maybe heard something about Hugo Correa or some other in a, in a dis disconnected way. So when, when here we are speaking about rediscovering, I, I, I imagine that we are rediscover rediscovering for them, making a kind of, uh, of continuum of, of this tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, that for me is natural, for, but I understand that not every, uh, the other people, other countries shouldn't know about how the different stages and different moments in the Chilean science fiction history are connected. And they are connected, and this is the kind of effort that we, we have been doing here. Can I add uh, very quick something? I think we, uh, we are also rediscovering Latin American science fiction between Latin Americans because of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were uh, a little bit um, disgregated and, and scattered and um, now being in front of our screens made us look at, at, at each other. And that's very positive, I think. I, I personally, since March, I've been learning a lot, a lot, a lot from um, everyone in Colombia, in Peru, in Argentina, in Ecuador. So that's for us too, internally. You haven't read about Chile, huh? And Chile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Yeah. So Unless Paula has anything else to add to this particular question. I agree with everything Rodrigo and Gabriela said, mostly with, with what Gabriela said, because I do notice that finally we are also looking at each other. Like all the Latin American countries are like, oh, wait, you're there. Let's do something together. <laughs> we speak the same language. <laughs> it's going to be easy. <laughs> so it's uh, that sort of new for the dynamics we had, we had like more local dynamics, like each country on their own, maybe in the big book first with Colombia and everything. But this is a, a new level of uh, communication and, and cooperation, ideally, uh, to come. So I think that's that's what what we are rediscovering a little bit is is us as a community, not just each country on their own. Right. Yep, I, I agree. I've, I've found the same thing. And, and I think that's that's something that's very valuable. And now we have 10 minutes left, so we're going to have to start wrapping up. But I wanted to give each of you, as the, the thank you for, for, for being on this panel, I wanted to give each of you the chance to talk about anything forthcoming you might have coming up. One book, story, anthology appearance, or someone else's book that you really, really, really love and you would give them your place to tell us about what's coming up. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to start. Okay, Paula, go. No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, not me. Someone else. <laughs> well, I can, I can start for Paula. <laughs> um, in, in, in Mexico, we are having, um, we are having Mexicona, which is a Mexican science fiction and uh, fantasy speculative uh, literature convention. It's in Spanish, but it's important, you know, um, that we are making it because of this, because we are trying to make um, an other to decenter these main discourses of, of, of the genre. And uh, we are having a lot of, of Latin American participants because that was our, um, uh, our main um, desire to, to put um, on dialogue our traditions um, uh, from Spanish. But I, I would also like to, to, to say that you should uh, check out Strange Horizons Mexican Special Edition. It's... Um, mm -hmm due um, in November, so you, you check it out, please. You are going to meet um, a lot of authors that are producing uh, right now. And um, I myself been translated into English and, uh, and, and Italian, and now I, I think French, but um, there are a lot, a lot of, um, of Mexican uh, writers that can capture your attention. And I think that would be a, a, a very good sample of it. Okay, Rodrigo, let La Paula think a little longer. Well, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in the personal line, uh, I'm finishing a, sh a short novel that's called Into the, Into the Dark Night. Uh, it, it would be in English, something like that. Um, but it's in Spanish and for a local, a local publisher. Uh, uh, but uh, the name in Spanish? Uh, en esta larga noche. Perfect. Uh, um, la, the thing is um, that I'm also involved in the Chilean science fiction community. You know, I showed you my t-shirt before. So we have some projects. Uh, and the most important thing or more ambitious one is to do, well, it's, it's an anthology that's almost 3D and it's going to have 30 something Chilean writers of the genre in one, in one book. And also our official, first official delegation of Chile to the WorldCon in Washington DC. So we are very excited about that. We are bothering the people from Washington. They are uh, bothering from time to time asking space for panels and fan tables and things like that. Um, I was a member of the Yokohama um, committee for workers, so I know I know how to what what they can offer. <laughs> so the, 
<laughs> so okay, well, go ahead. Huh? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, that's that's my project, a, a personal one on a community model. Paula? Okay, my turn. <laughs> I was thinking about it. No, my, my next book is uh, scheduled for next year, so we'll have to, to wait a little bit for that one. It's going to be more on the new weird sort of part of the playground. Uh, so my, my shout out is uh, for Proxima and Axon, for people to check them out because that's where you will find the most amount of offers uh, from Latin America. <laughs> so that's yeah, that. a, a good place to, to check right now. And they're always like, making something new, trying to show more works, uh, more stories. So I'm leaving them the, <laughs> the spotlight. <laughs> seconded, seconded. Proxima and Axon are great. Thank you, Paula. But, pro oh. Sorry, question. Proxima is alive? Yes. Yes, yeah, because it, it took a time, took a, a little recess or something. Well, I don't know. Laura's publishing it regularly now. Mm. On my own, I'm going to cheat because my next book is a monster book, and I don't think science fiction audiences are going to really love that. And then following one after that is a literary fiction book, so that one doesn't count either. <laughs> so the, the book I launched at Worldcon last year, which I think is good for this audience, it's called Off the Beaten Path, and it's a collection mm. of reprinted stories. All of them appeared originally in English, and they are off the beaten path. They don't take place in any European country. They don't take place in the US. So they're either set in Africa or in Asia, or very specifically to this, in Latin America. So if you would like to see that, it's on Amazon. It's everywhere. So that's the one I'm shouting out to. I can cheat. I'm the moderator. So, <laughs> so I would like to close this out now. Um, goodbyes can be said in Spanish, so gracias a todos por escuchar. Um, I would like to thank the guests. You have been amazing, amazing. And I'd like to thank FutureCon for giving us the chance to talk about our science fiction for once. And I'd like to remind the audience that's watching us that they can subscribe to this YouTube channel. There's a whole bunch of days still to come of, of excellent, excellent programming. You can log into our Discord, which is kind of a chat forum, where you can talk to everyone involved. And you can support FutureCon, of course, with whatever monetary support you can give us, them, because I'm not, I'm just talking. So um, whatever you can give, this is something that a lot of people have put a lot of time and effort into. It's coming out really, really well. So, so I'd like to thank them too. So I'm going to leave the last words to our panelists to say goodbye in our languages. So go ahead whoever wants to get it started, or we can just say, I'll say bye, ciao. <laughs> <laughs> like the typical Zoom meeting ending. <laughs> so I'll start, ciao, muchas gracias. Eh, gracias a FutureCon y gracias Gustavo por estar moderándonos a todos nosotros. Es un gusto, Rodrigo, Gabriela, y gracias a todos por estar escuchándonos, acompañándonos. Cualquier pregunta que tengan, o se la hacen a FutureCon, o nos escriben, busquen. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Adiós, muchas gracias. Gracias a FutureCon and thanks to all for watching us. Adiós, gracias, gracias y hasta la vista. See you on Discord, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> eh... Gracias, son geniales. Sobrevivimos todos. Sobrevivimos, <laughs> amigos. Ahora, ahora puedo hacer las morisquetas que querías.